Now, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and the format's going to be very similar to last time. I'm going to make some short introductions. This time I'll try not to miss anybody. <laughs> but you never, with me, you never can tell. It's always kind of a crapshoot. Um, but then we'll have each member, now this time it's um, community organizations, or they represent parts of our, the community. I'd like them to talk a little bit about their organization or their field, give a summary of that, um, you know, and then we'll have the question and answer period in terms of community resources and maybe some ideas about ways to increase you know, our potential of reaching out and working together as well. So um, our first panelist is a superstar. She is like the, I think, the person in Grand Rapids. Um, oh boy. Uh, uh, <laughs> now, uh, Alana um, Bridges is the Veteran Service Community Coordinator um, at the, is it the Wantrum? Oh, Alterum. Alterum Institute. Um, she also, and for me much more importantly, is the chairperson of the West Michigan Veterans Coalition, which is just doing some fabulous work here in terms of coordinating efforts, getting the message out, and really helping people. Um, I met her when she was at Grand Valley State University in the Wounded Warrior TBI Education Project, which was a phenomenal program. So we're very pleased to have her. Okay. Next we have um, Stephen Santek. Um, is that quite right? But close Sanstead. enough. It's okay. Sanstead. It's close enough. <laughs> um, this is what they hap happens when they get a dyslexic um, <clears throat> moderator here, but my heart's in the right direction. There you go. Okay, so we've got um, Stephen, he's the founder and president of Priority Development Corporation. He's a Vietnam era Navy veteran um, who was honorably discharged from the Navy in 1972 um, after 22 consecutive months overseas. Right now, he currently serves as the, in a volunteer capacity as the vice president of the Michigan Veterans Task Force and oversees the Warriors Missionary Program. Um, and he'll tell us more about that as we go along. We're also very honored to have Dr. Darrell Plunkett, um, who is a veteran of the United States Air Force. He got his PhD in counseling education. Um, and he's also an adjunct professor at Western Mi Michigan University, and he's head of the Grand Rapids Vet, Vet, Vet Center, or <laughs> Veterans Center. <laughs> And um, then we have Andy um, D. Braber, who's the executive director of the Heartside Mission here in Grand Rapids, who deal a, a great deal with our homeless veteran population. So I'm, I'm looking forward to what he has to say. And finally, we have Carolyn. Carino, who, in addition to her many roles, is also um, a drug and alcohol specialist, and we wanted to include her to talk about what was available within the community for the drug and alcohol problems that can often occur. So, um, Ms. Bridges, why don't you start and we'll just go sure. down the line kind of. Um, summarizing hi. what you're How's everyone about? doing? We're almost um, almost to the end, which is unfortunate. I've been um, very blessed to be a part of this conference. It's actually opened the doors and it's connecting people and resources together and we're at least having the dialogue about something that you don't normally see in Grand Rapids, which has been wonderful, so thank you for having me. Um, something that you didn't say, I'm actually a part of the military family. My husband actually is going to be retiring here soon and uh, he's a command sergeant major currently serving with the Michigan National Guard in the G3 shop. Uh, so I've been married to him for over 21 years and I understand what the issues are when it comes particularly with the family and our service members when they come back from deployment. I was also blessed to work out of the Grand Valley Armory as a family assistance center specialist working on mitigating issues from the beginning of the deployment 
during the depo deployment and post-deployment, and then years after the deployment, um, trying to understand a system that was really confusing and, and these uh, excellence cylinders of excellence, we'd like to say, uh, trying to get people and organizations coming together, not reinventing the wheel, but trying to navigate the systems. And essentially, that is what the West Michigan Veteran <coughs> Coalition is. We're about connecting with one another, be it a veteran, a family member, advocates, uh, service providers, employers, uh, organizations that serve veterans, uh, bringing them together so they know the person on the other side, that they're able to refer that person to the correct and appropriate resource and service. Um, so my, my question is always this, so how do we do that? How do we connect? If I have a veteran that comes to me and says, you know what, I, I had a TBI, um, I'm having these issues, of course, they're not going to just come to me and open up and tell me this. It's, it's generally their families that, that reach me out. And um, where, can we, where can we send them? Um, so my question was for um, our, our last speaker was, all right, I want an interprofessional team working together, solving and mitigating these issues bringing them to the very beginning of what services are there, um, to the resources that are going to support our veteran. If it's a financial need, if, they're going to, if their home is going to go through foreclosure, let's, let's make sure that we can mitigate that. Um, those are just kind of like the, out, the outer areas, areas of our problems that our, our veterans are serving. So essentially, our West Michigan Veteran Coalition, we meet quarterly, we identify uh, four topics of education, employment, health care, and quality of life. We try to identify uh, key areas within those topics, and then we try to mitigate them by uh, searching for uh, resources to kind of help and, and you know, refer to veterans. We have veterans that also come to our meetings, which are great. They're able to actually talk to the actual agency that's, that's providing the service. I have never seen in my days of working in veteran services is working with the VA, working with um, uh, private nonprofit organizations, uh, and having those key people talking amongst themselves so they're able to help that veteran a step farther. That veteran comes into the, the VA system, they tend to get stuck. Um, and they are only, they're only in the box of the VA, and they don't get a whole lot of other supports if that field person over at the VA doesn't know of that, those community resources. So essentially, the, the coalition, that's what we do. We try to connect the dots. What are the services? So. My step. Um, well, first of all, it's a privilege to be here. And uh, I would describe myself as a Vietnam era veteran in transition. And what I mean by that is that it's only very recently that after 40 some years of issues not knowing they were there, that I was brought into this equation and understanding, which uh, is one of the motivating reasons why myself and my wife are participating in the work that we're, we're currently doing. And um, I first, uh, I think everybody here, if we had the time to do it, and we were talking at lunch, we all have a story that brings us to the table. Everybody sitting in the audience, everybody up here has an interconnected story. And one of the things I've been impressed with in participating in this is, is when that story penetrates into the heart and into the soul of each one of us, something happens and it brings you closer. And that's why when vets share stories with vets, those things happen. Um, I first got exposed to that issue uh, about a year ago when my brother-in-law, who suffered from severe PTSD, a combat veteran out of Vietnam, uh, passed away suddenly from cancer down in Florida, and I had to go down and help bring his wife, my wife's sister, uh, back uh, to Michigan. Uh, that started a chain reaction in my own life because we had 30 years of, of a traumatic interaction as both men, my coming out of the Vietnam era, not having served in combat in Vietnam, he having served in combat in Vietnam, and my not feeling like I had any problems whatsoever on a comparative basis. But our lives clashed for 30 years until the last couple of weeks, actually the last couple of years of his death, when he experienced a finally came home event. 
And I realized in Michigan we have 350,000 Vietnam era veterans out of the 700,000 vets that we have. Those vets right now are challenged by the coming home and the interaction with the last 12 years of war that we have. And it's put us in a very um, interesting dynamic, not just in Michigan, but across the country. Well, last year when I came back from that, there was an activity at my church and it said, uh, I got a little flyer in the mail, it said uh, we're talking about starting a warrior ministry. And there was um, uh, three gentlemen that were at that meeting that uh, uh, changed, changed my life. One is Captain Bealen sitting out here in the audience. The other is Rick Briggs, Colonel, retired Rick Briggs, and um, Chaplain Kaiser. And they spoke at our church about this dynamic of, of how do we do something uh, to integrate into the community and bring advocacy to the level uh, where the veteran needs help. And they had started an organization based on a Partners in Care initiative by the Michigan National Guard uh, a few years earlier. And the Michigan Veterans Task Force is the uh, first uh, interfaith-based nonprofit public charity. And it took a while, but through their diligent efforts, uh, was finally established at the end of this last year as a bona fide faith-based charity for advocacy help to veterans. And I just would like to symbolize what that means. Real simple. We've got a little graphic here. We don't have. Do you want me to help you no, hold that up? Or? Come right around here. And um, I'll let uh, Rick and Gabe, could you come up here for a second? I'm going to do a little demonstration here of what we're trying to do with all the things we just talked about. Um, we just spent a lot of time understanding the vertical integration of the needs of the vets, okay? And, and that vertical integration is all the professional services and all those things we need. But what we're about in Michigan right now is building that horizontal infrastructure and network that we all need in order to give us our base of operation. And this organization was started based in Lansing, these are all the faith-based symbols of various faiths, and many of us are, are Christian-based in our faith. But you've heard a lot of talk about the soul and the spiritual connected dimension that everybody is talking about. And one of the visions and missions of this organization is to bring that component into every aspect of what is going on. Chaplain uh, Henson, who's the senior chaplain of the Michigan National Guard and Gabe, got together and said, how can we in Michigan uh, connect to this Partners in Care initiative at the time that the federal government is cutting all its costs out of what's going on. And so one simple example they came up with was this idea of creating warrior ministries and, and building a uh, horizontal integration of chaplains across the state of Michigan in order to provide a connected base that can interact with all the other service providers and make sure that 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 interaction from the spiritual dimension gets covered. Thanks, guys. Um, and one other member is here of our executive team, Joy uh, Brewer, sitting right up here. Joy, you stand for just a minute? Um, Joy is a, is a wife of a retired um, uh, Army captain and serves on our group. Gabe, by the way, who is a very humble gentleman, uh, recently uh, became a, is becoming a chaplain himself. But he is a Iraqi uh, Purple Heart as well. And, uh, and uh, Rick, a number of years, and myself, all coming from different dimensions of how do you connect these, these dots. Mm -hmm. And we're here in the capacity to better integrate across the state of Michigan. We were invited to come and participate in the initiatives in Grand Rapids as we build this network. We talked at lunch today about how difficult that is with all the things that are going on. And if it's so confusing for us, you can imagine the vets trying to figure it out. And um, we haven't figured out all those pieces, but we are a work in progress, as we, as we talked about. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to help. We have 35 churches now in a, tr in a coalition of churches in the Lansing area that are helping our veterans get access to resources. Our church alone has a quarter of a million dollar deacons fund in it that works with helping those people in need in the community. And when we held a warrior ministry initiative, we had no idea 
how many veterans in need we had in our church because they hide. They hide in plain sight. And when we do activities and we have some coming up, how many veterans are in here right now? Could you stand up? As a, as a gesture, and I don't know how many of you are married and there are a number of events that Rick and others are planning across this state, but um, a couple events coming up next Saturday, there'll be a thing at Trinity Church over in Lansing where Chaplain Kaiser and Gabe and others will be digging again deeper into how to help uh, volunteers such as myself get educated and integrated with being able to be an advocate support, because this is a I got nine grandchildren now, and I feel I, I got a 50-year endeavor. Most of them have never, never known us not being at war because the oldest one now is just 17. So we're living in a new era and coming out of the Vietnam arena. Uh, you don't even want to know where my politics are trying to wrestle with all of this stuff. But anyway, that's why we're here to try to help facilitate getting an integrated network in place. Am I out of time yeah. yet? Let me just about. So the very okay. good. So one more thing that I want to say, if you're, if you're a married veteran, uh, we have an event coming up the last weekend of April, and it's a, it's a free weekend retreat at the VFW National Home for Children in Eaton Rapids, and we'll uh, give you two nights there and some interaction with other veterans, and uh, it's free to you with plenty of snacks and food and fellowship in a quiet, beautiful 629-acre campus in which to uh, uh, work on your relationships. My wife and I have been married 44 years. I don't have time to tell you our story, but we have one like everybody else does. But there's reasons why we're still here and why I'm still able to be here, because circumstances should have said no. Great example of the community coming together and welcoming veterans in a real way. So, uh, Dr. Plunkett, um, tell us a little bit about your organization. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. And before I get started real good, um, on behalf of the Grand Rapids Vet Center, uh, to all of the veterans, thank you for your service. And to all of the veterans that have been deployed to the combat zone, welcome home, and thank you for your service. Uh, I could literally talk about, I did this before, I can literally talk about the vet center for about an hour straight, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all the short version um, uh, and a little bit of history of who we are and what we do. Uh, the vet center, the vet center program, we are a part of the Department of Veteran Affairs. Here in Grand Rapids, the vet center is located at 2050 Breton Road on the corner of Breton and Burden. We are a tenant organization of the Battle Creek Medical Center. We are a separate entity of the VA, but we're still part of the VA. And that's very important to know because sometimes people don't understand that when they come to the vet center, they're actually receiving, going to receive vet center services. A little history about the vet center program. In 1979, a group of um, Vietnam veterans in California who were a little, if I may say, disgruntled with the services that they were receiving from the, from the VA. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> Thank you. They, they decided that um, the VA was not meeting their needs in terms of uh, counseling and talking about their readjustment issues from the war. So they started the peer-to-peer -peer counseling program themselves. It was little storefronts where they got together and they talked about their issues, their stories. And some vet-friendly folks in Congress got wind of what they were doing. Uh, subsequently, Public Law 9622 was enacted in 1979, which is established Readjustment Counseling Service, the Veteran Center Outreach Program, as part of the VA. And the idea was, the law was, that this program would be funded for two years. 
That was in 1979, and here we are today, 2014. We have 300 vet centers across the country, Puerto Rico, Guam, the American Samoa Islands. Each vet center is attached to a medical center. There are eight vet centers here in Michigan, and Grand Rapids is the only one on the southwest side of the state. In fact, uh, the team leader from the Traverse City Vet Center, Mr. Bill Fowle, is sitting right here. Uh, so again, the program has expanded. Let me tell you what we do. First and foremost, we're an outreach program, meaning that we go out and we find the veterans that need our services, that need VA services, and we try to get them engaged in those services. Then we have a three-tier counseling program. We do readjustment counseling for combat veterans and their family members. That's the first part. The second part is we do military sexual trauma counseling for any veteran that has been unfortunate enough to experience military sexual trauma. And the third tier of our counseling program is bereavement counseling. We do bereavement counseling for the family members of those military personnel who die while they're on active duty. So those are the three tiers of our counseling program along with the outreach. Now, the, very, the really interesting thing about the vet center, two things. One, we have a um, higher level of confidentiality than the normal VA, and we don't have the bureaucracy and the red tape that the VA has, meaning that for eligibility requirements, the, the veteran only needs to let us know by way of telling us and then subsequently providing their DD-214, which is their separation papers, saying that they were deployed to the combat zone. That's it. That's it. No red tape, no 10 easy forms, and don't <laughs> fill out this, and what's your cousin's last first name, and all that. Last first name. <laughs> last first name. Right. Very simple. And we, another thing that we do a little bit different is, uh, and, and, and I'll be done here, is that when we say we meet the needs of the people, we meet the needs of the people. And we, we don't have a waiting list in terms of uh, when they can receive services. There is no limitations on the number of times that they can be seen at the vet center. Um, and it was one last thing that I can't remember. <laughs> and, and there is no cost because they have already paid with their, se with their se selfless sacrifice. My goodness. <laughs> Andy, do you want to go ahead and talk about some of the work that the Hearthside Ministry is doing? Great, thank you. Uh, yes, as uh, Executive Director of Hearthside Ministry, I have the privilege, we have the privilege of working alongside folks who are either homeless or living in extreme poverty in the downtown Hearthside area of Grand Rapids, if you're not familiar with uh, Grand Rapids. It's the most densely populated part of our city and also uh, historically has been where the most poverty and, and homelessness has been present. Present. I also have the privilege of uh, sitting in the chair that our mayor sat in for 14 years as executive director of this organization. And both of us are clergy members with uh, associations in the United Church of Christ and the Reformed Church in America. And having been a pastor for the past 15 years or so in a variety of settings, uh, I've seen the power of deep ritual to make a difference in people's lives. Um, our mission at Heartside is to be sharing faith, hope, and life, and transforming our community. So we're very relationship-based. It's our desire to build relationships of trust with folks, as well as community-based, and building community. That is something that I think all of us, I mean, no matter what socioeconomic strata we come from, are longing for forms of authentic community. And so to be able to find that in a place 
where so many real needs are also met. It helps people learn to trust again, to build relationships where they're resourcing one another and helping find the fine resources that you've heard here and throughout the day, and then walking each other to them. I mean, we see that literally happening. It is our goal that in the chaos of living on the street, we nurture that safe space where neighbors are loved, where they're valued, and where they find their unique voice and a way to express it. Uh, we do that particularly through art. So a place where folks can come in, sit down, grab a pen. We have a woodworking shop. We have a pottery studio. We have a fiber arts area as well as painting. And it's amazing to watch people work through the trauma in their lives, whether it's through combat or what this work is also so valuable for with us is being homeless and being on the streets is a form of, of uh, severe trauma that is not unlike, unfortunately, all too often what combat trauma is like. 60% um, of people living on the streets have been assaulted with a weapon. Uh, we do that through advocacy, walking along with folks and resourcing them through education and through spirituality. So we, we tend to see three different kinds of veterans in the work we do. Uh, one would be like Scott, who, as we've heard here in, in many ways, uh, with whether it's moral injury, PTSD, somebody comes up behind him, unknowing, maybe touches him or makes a loud noise or something happens and turns and that reflex kicks in. And suddenly, he's got a felony assault charge, put in prison, loses benefits that he's had, and now is trying to figure out uh, how to get back into uh, society. Most of the folks we see struggle with severe persistent mental health issues or, and or having a criminal record. Um, the uh, second type of veteran that we'll see frequently, frequently are folks with less than honorable discharges. So they don't have access to many of the services that folks with honorable discharges have. And those less than honorable discharges may well have been because of mental, due to mental illnesses that they came into the service with. And then finally, um, we have uh, neighbors like Ron, who at this point in his life, um, due to his service in the military, due to his self-medication through alcohol primarily, due to getting beaten up on the street, um, is unable to follow through. Unable to follow through on finding the resources that are there. And so that takes that intense one-on-one -on -one work of walking with someone. And still, when you can't be there 24 hours, you can't make decisions for people. And, they're gonna, and Ron, in this case, continues to make decisions. And we place no judgment on that, given where he's at and what he's been through. But that don't follow through on accessing those services. He's capable of making decisions for himself, and we have to let him do that. And our heart breaks each time he comes back in, uh, broken again, and trying to start to rebuild those relationships of trust that we can walk alongside and make a difference. Um, I think I, I will add one more thing and leave it at that, and that is we can use your help, um, please. If you'd lo like to come down and help, uh, help us start a veteran storytelling group with folks who are homeless or living in extreme poverty, uh, you'd be more than welcome to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Before I have Carolyn go, <clears throat> I'll mind you, write those questions down, pass them to the aisles, otherwise you're stuck with my questions. Not a good thing. <laughs> Carolyn's going to talk about some of the substance abuse um, services that are available in the area. Right. First, I'd like to know how many people are in uh, our therapists in here, clinicians. How many are for profit? Are you kidding? Oh, one. Yeah. Oh, yes, you are. Okay. I have a. Okay. Um, I'm a social worker, and usually that is frowned on, isn't it? Um, and I've, I've been sitting here wondering why. Why am I here? I have my story about my father. That's one of the reasons I'm here, but it's for me. Um, when we moved here from Massachusetts, uh, we lived on, uh, believe this, Michigan Veterans Facility grounds. 
for, for four years. And it was a different place then. Um, and I remember, this is how young I am, I remember uh, getting on the back of a man named Amos, his wheelchair, he had, we used to, there were four of us, four girls, and we'd run around these grounds, and these men were so nice to us. And, and I remember standing on the back of Amos's wheelchairs on these pegs, and he would take me for a ride down this hill. Amos had no legs. And I loved Amos. And I, he, he said, don't tell your mom. I mean, it was wonderful. And then he had these huge, to me, this big of muscles, and he would roll that chair up that hill. It's, the hill's still there. And then we'd be, we'd go, race down that, and we used to do that all day. These men were wonderful to me, and I'm thinking, maybe that's where some of this came from. Maybe some of this came from my mother being adamant that the American flag did not touch the ground. That flag was up at dawn, and it was down at dusk, and we folded it in the triangle that's supposed to be snapping it. My father was a Marine in World War II. I mean, there's a lot of history here, but this is also for me to heal. Um, and, and, and being a for-profit person, being here, um, I, I wonder why. I'm not averse to giving sliding scales, uh, fee scales for people. Um, one thing I found, I'm going to shift into what I can actually do. One thing I found is that um, when I assess people, um, I always ask about military service in the family. How many generations even? Um, that has a lot to do with what's happening in front of me with a person with a presenting problem. Often, I do believe that PTSD and, mo and moral injury is a generational issue. It's ge general, generationally, uh, uh, has a generational component to it, just like addiction has a genetic component to it. And children can often react similarly to the way their, par their, sp their parents do. Usually it's fathers, now it's changing. Um, in under stress, you get, you get told to do things that are not, quote, normal. Um, so I always do that history, along with a, with a um, alcohol addiction history in the family. And um, right now we're looking at alcohol abuse as being one of the most prevalent problems um, with returning veterans, where after three to four month, months of uh, people returning, 27% um, meet the criteria for alcohol abuse. And alcohol is often a factor in um, one car crashes, motorcycle accidents. I'm also seeing sexual addiction. They were talking about that earlier with some brain uh, dysfunction. And um, opiate addiction, iatrogenic addiction with um, OxyContin. I, I try to help patients feel Go get to a place where they tolerate pain. Most people won't say, I want to be pain free. It's impossible. I mean, talk to anybody uh, in here that's had some uh, war or combat injuries. It's impossible to live without pain. But they have to learn to do it tolerably. And um, I also utilize, not, I don't do it, but send them to people, acupuncturists, um, this hyperbolic thing I'm very interested in. Um, the um, Addiction centers in town have decreased. Uh, I started my work at the Salvation Army Turning Point, which I uh, associate with uh, McCrud down in San Diego, um, Marine Corps Recruiting Depot. You know what I'm talking about, Marines in here? Um, <laughs> hoorah. Hoorah did I get? Yeah? Semper Fi? OK. Um, that, that was, we had people that were from the street, and then we had people that had very high incomes. It was a great mix. We got, had people from Jackson uh, Prison. It was a great mix. And you had people in for 30 days. I got out when I, uh, <laughs> get me started. <laughs> Somebody in uh, a supposedly health maintenance organization told me I could have a cocaine addict in treatment for three days. I lost it. I said, why don't you just put him in a bleeping closet and let him just sit there for three days? Because it's not going to, you know, it's not going to work. So I got disciplined for that. Um, <laughs> but I have a tendency, as you, anybody's known me long enough, my husband, bless his heart, uh, once I get something under my, a burr in my saddle, I, I go for it. Um, so I knew it was time to get out of there. And, and it wasn't Salvation Army's fault, but... Um, I needed to go and be a private practitioner so I could treat people in a reasonable way. And I found that many, many um, 
treatment centers across the country are insurance driven. I don't know why, get me started on that too. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, uh, Dr. Zanakis talked about six month treatment. We did have somebody doing that for a while here in Grand Rapids, but it got to be just the elite were being treated. And um, I, I could be on a soapbox all day with that. But in, in, right now in Grand Rapids, one thing I want to tell you, if you have a patient that has an alcohol addiction and they use it, um, they're, they're an alcoholic, do not let them detox at home. They must be detoxed medically. The medical, the people that do it in Grand Rapids are Pine Rest, they'll do it, and that's nice because they, they have a uh, addictions treatment center there, um, and they can slide right in there. Any emergency room will do it. Just take an emergency room and tell them they have, they're detoxing. And um, Salvation, uh, Salvation Army Turning Point, well, yes ma'am? On behalf of the emergency room staff members. Oh, okay. Um, we are coming to a point where they are not going to be able to manage doing alcohol detox mm. in an emergency department in any emergency room in the United States. Why is that, ma'am? We are. Oh, you're overwhelmed, right? A lot of emergency departments don't have the best. Yeah. They don't have the room. They are treating cardiac patients in the hallway. Mm -hmm. And so to be looking at your emergency department as your solution for your alcohol detox. Now I'm talking, I'm not saying it is a solution. I'm saying that it's a life or death situation. If the person goes into respiratory arrest as a result of detoxing from alcohol, they gotta be put into the emergency room. I'm not saying just take them in, Uncle Joe's, I didn't mean to point you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Joe is drunk and we wanna dry him out. I'm sorry, if I, I'm sorry. I, my, my irritation's not with you, okay? It's, it's with the system you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. But my, my, my point is it's, it's a medical emergency is what I'm saying. Yeah, if, if it is a medical, medical emergency. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. You don't drop Uncle Joe off, uh, off at them. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to Club Med. <laughs> yeah. so, so thank you for tell, saying that because I don't want people doing that either. So um, we do what we can and I'm hoping we'll attract more uh, private practitioners to give a hand. I mean, I think for me, it's a, my duty. I didn't serve in the military. My father told me they would have kicked me out if I went into uh, any kind of recruit depot or boot camp. Uh, so that would have been a failed career, but um, he knew about that. So I, I just think it's my duty to give back. And I hope more people do that if they're in private practice. And I, I don't know how to send that word out. Well, you think you are, but I think also we've got to, really as a community let insurance company and hospitals know i mean can you imagine going in for a three-day treatment for um colon cancer yeah can you imagine having going to the emergency room to get treated for colon cancer you know it's it takes years you know and alcoholism drug addiction is a disease just like cancer, and, it's and it can be just as deadly. Well, and also just asking the question, are you a veteran? Because maybe that yeah. colon cancer is a related um, uh, disease from their time in Vietnam. And maybe that veteran hadn't even applied for any kind of disability. So it's just something to ask, and I don't think a civilian community are, are really asking, are you a veteran? So just if you're in private practice or in a private clinic, just that's part of your intake yeah. mm -hmm. process, which is, is very important to know. So I'll calm down now. Good. No, I don't. It's, it's much more interesting <laughs> <laughs> when you're, you're on your high horse. We have a good time. Good. So questions, um, why don't you pass those in? We'll collect them. Just, Let me start with one that's occurred to me, particularly today, as we heard these examples of um, veterans who've come back and then one way or another have usually um, because of impulsive behavior, this reflex action, end up in legal trouble. Um, what does the panel think about 
veterans courts and so how likely are we to see one here in Grand Rapids? Is there anything we can do to promote that? Judge Jordan, did you did you set him up? Because yeah, yeah. stand up, sir. Essentially, what what we're trying to do uh, with the West Michigan Veteran Coalition is actually establish a Kent County Veteran Treatment Court. Um, we have been meeting with several judges within the. Um, Kent County, and I think we're on track for hopefully, I'm hoping before 2015, but um, it's a process. Uh, mm -hmm. But sure. we have a judge that has volunteered that we could utilize um, his court. So now getting all the supports, what are we gonna need for the support? We're gonna need the mentors. We'd like veterans that, that had served, that would like to be mentors. Um, that's gonna be a, a quintessential part of this veteran treatment court. Um, and you know, we'll have the our, our veteran justice outreach from the, the VA being a part of that uh, team. We'd like to have a case manager on there as well as uh, uh, other staff staff on there but um, there are many veteran treatment courts uh, one of the first ones were um, uh, Ingham and Ionia counties and they really have forged the way um, for the state of Michigan and I'm hoping that every county can at least establish one um, because it is it's wrong that the, that our um, Kent County veterans actually have to go through the Ionia court system or the um, Allegan County uh, court system, and we have all the resources here in Kent County. So, if, if, yep. if I may, um, you're, you're absolutely right. And right now, the vet center, we already see the veterans who are referred to us from the uh, Ionia vet court, and we're looking forward to working with the vet court. It's going to be established here in Kent County. The, the Vet Center here in Grand Rapids, we are responsible for 22 counties. So wow. all of those counties that get vet courts, mm -hmm. then we'll see those That's better. It's 25% of the state. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything we can do as a community to lobby Absolutely. or write people? <laughs> Thank you. Or? Um, actually, up here. <laughs> um, I don't mean to get on my soapbox, but since sure, I'm here, sure. um, it, what we're trying to do is get a, a millage passed, or at least on the a, the proposal on the ballot for the November 2014 election to um, a, a, a millage of a .05 to support our veteran services in Kent County. What that would include more veteran um, service officers that are actually at the county level, uh, that are stationed at the office, that are there consistently, um, that are able to do the disability claims, that are able to do help with other resources within the community, almost being kind of like that, um, the epicenter of where the information goes instead of having um, veteran service officers. Um, when you go to the clinic, uh, you essentially have about four people, five people waiting in line. You have to sign on to talk to a veteran service officer. It's very difficult. You're waiting in the room at the clinic or in the waiting room. Um, and if you're a female veteran, and if you've had suffered from military sexual trauma, to be sitting in that type of setting um, is quite intimidating. So it's I, so we're going to be doing that as well as outreach. One, one more point with that. Joy, is there anything the state is, can do to help as these initiatives are coming with the legislation from the state of Michigan? That one bill that you talked about, that we did that. There's a whole series of legislation working on that. Mm -hmm. So become aware of that, correct? Yeah. Um, are you going to need signatures for the petition? I think the governor is going to put dollars into support. That's what I was thinking. Are you going to need signatures for the petition to put it on? Or um, I need support that? letters. Support letters? Okay. Because I got the proposals all set. It's just if you're, in, if you're interested and you want to know more information, please take my information down. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know if it's on the, um, I, I, think we, I think we've got it on the, in the booklet, but at least also you I can, can um, contact us through the website where you registered, and we'll get that information. Could you we know, and we may be giving letter? you, we may email you too with some of that information depending. Yes. Okay, so we'll have a form letter on there, print it up, stick it in the mail, right? Sound good? Yep. Sounds good to me. There's also a movement to, to get the you know. felony box off from employment applications. So that's something to be watching for. We do have to check that box. Uh, employment, getting employment, getting housing. It, it, okay. You go in the circular files. So no matter how many, whatever, it was 20 years ago. Um, right. Good. 
Dr. Plunkett, I got the, the next question here. I'm going to put you on the spot. I apologize for this, but I've, I've heard it in a number of situations. Why do VA have different PTSD programs? Why do vets in Michigan come out worse than they do in other um, cities, states like Chicago? We've heard very good things about the PTSD program in Chicago. <laughs> do you have a sense of what's going on? I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> but I, I do know this. I know that the PTSD program uh, th that's in North Chicago. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where the veterans say they want to go. They want to go to North Chicago, especially mm -hmm. the Vietnam veterans that's uh, been there before. Well, the medical center in Battle Creek has the very same program in North as North Chicago does now. They didn't before, but they do now. How, how long, long ago has that started? This has been about uh, two years now, two or years. three two or three years that they have the same program at the Battle Creek mm -hmm. Medical Center that they have in North Chicago. Do they still have the same psychiatrists at Battle Creek that they had <laughs> five years ago? <laughs> Wait, this is a trap. If he I know, answer, you can't don't answer that. That, 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 that I don't know. Okay. That okay, I don't fair know. Right. But here, here, here's, here's the other, I, I remember. Remember I said I, 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 I remember. <laughs> Right now, there, there's a lot of buzz going around uh, around town, around the country, about helping the veterans, and, and everybody's on the bandwagon. And one of the uh, cliches, and one of the actually things that people are doing is trying to make sure that the veterans are getting to the places that they need to go. And you hear the buzz word, no wrong door. Right. No mm -hmm. wrong door. Well, the vet center, that has been our philosophy since the onset. Mm -hmm. No wrong door. Meaning that if you come to the vet center and for whatever reasons you're not eligible for our services or you need something in addition to the vet center, then we will get you to the right place. Notice how I said that. I did not say that we will send you to the right place. <laughs> we will get you to the right place and, and, and we'll sit with you and we'll make the phone calls and we'll get you connected to the people that you need to be connected to. If you, if you call the vet center and you say, well, I, I, I really need to get an appointment to get my, my dog neutered because this is the vet center, then we're going to say, okay, let us get you over to Bread and Village. Here's the phone. Right. <laughs> right? Bread and Village Animal Clinic mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. But that's, that's that's what we do. That's cool. Um, Just one more question. Okay, yep. Is Battle Creek doing EMDR? But that's critical for PTSD treatment. For some people. Yeah. For some people. Um, offhand, I do not know if they do MDR, EMDR at Battle Creek. Let me tell you where we do EMDR. Yes. There you go. <laughs> we, 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 we have a licensed marriage and family therapist who is trained in EMDR, and she does EMDR. And I do have to say, our Grand Rapids Vet Center, um, I refer a lot of people there. Uh, so, And I just don't refer anyone to anyone, <laughs> unless, of course, I know that person. I guess I got one more note. If, if you go at the vet center, you have an inpatient program, you, does, does that do the EMDR and you turn them loose in the street? Or, because when you do EMDR, that veteran, he may be 65 now, or I'm 45, mm -hmm. when you do the EMDR, you're 19 again for that session. Mm -hmm. And even when it's over, you are still bound up. Mm -hmm. And you just can't turn that person loose. Our, our, again, our, our, our licensed and marriage family therapist, she is trained in EMDR, and we're not going to let anybody leave the vet center if they're all wound up, whether they were doing EMDR or whether they had too much coffee. <laughs> and so you have a place they can go, or conceivably you could get them into a hospital setting for a while if they needed Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Good. Good. Great. Um, Next question, um, what legal resources are available for the medically retired veteran and their families? Offhand, um, Cooley Law actually meets, I believe, twice a week. I could be wrong. Kathy, um, 
fact, her card's right here. Um, essentially what they do is they offer free legal, um, they don't represent you, but they're able to look at the documents that you have that are able to guide you in a better um, direction and at least explain what your document means. Uh, so uh, Kathy Rowland and I, Rolander, is, I can give this number out, 616. In fact, we could probably uh, put it on the website. Put it on the website. Give it out yeah. as well. And her number is 616-301-6800, extension 6708. It's 301-6800, extension 6708. Is that 616? That's 616. And they meet at the Vet Center, uh, not the Vet Center, I'm sorry, um, 620 Century in Grand Rapids. Um, and I don't have the schedule on me right now, uh, but Kathy could give that to you. And we can also put that on the, um, on, on the web, mm -hmm. website or maybe a follow-up letter. Yes, Dr. Plunkett. If I may, in, if you want additional information and you want to find out specifically uh, where to get that, uh, those services. If you'll call this phone number, 616-285-5795. 616-285-5795. That's the vet center. Oh, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's not Helen no, for a good no, time. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the vet center. <laughs> and I'll make sure the vet center has that number, so. <laughs> you probably already know it. <laughs> Next question um, for any of the speakers. I'm not a veteran. Does this disqualify me from treating veterans? No. And I think we've had a couple speakers. Is there a veteran up on this panel, sir? Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Uh, if, 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 if I may. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, for the vet center, no. No. Now, we have a mandate from Congress that um, a percentage, and Bill, I'm not sure what, 60% of our staff, our employees, are veterans. And we have to have at least one combat veteran counselor therapist on the staff. And here in Grand Rapids, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, counselors, including myself, and three of us are veterans, and we have one who is a combat veteran, and the other three are civilians, but uh, for all it's worth, the licensed and marriage and family therapist, she was married for 23 odd years to a uh, Air Force veteran. Mm -hmm. Which is it? It's helpful. Right. No. No. It's well, helpful to have an understanding of military culture. It is helpful to understand um, what that veteran is is dealing with and their families dealing with to, to better serve them. But wouldn't, as a clinician, wouldn't that be your in your best interest to know about your patient? Yes. And, and, and just a note, a note. And one of the things that we, we talk to the to the veterans about is sometimes it 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 may be clinical best practices that the person that they're working with is not a veteran. Wrap your brain around that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if you're uh, are not a vet and you're a clinician, the important is just to be genuine, to be honest, clear, I can't understand what you've been through, but I'm here to help you any way I can. And um, I think as Dr. Shea said, the other veterans, if this works right, putting together peers, they do the heavy lifting. You know, oftentimes we're just there to kind of <clears throat> keep time and make it a safe environment and those kinds well, of things. Well, two, two things that come to mind as, as a clinician when we, when we start talking about uh, whether the, the therapist or clinician should be a veteran or not. One, if they are a veteran, and especially if they're a combat veteran, yes, they will understand, they may understand. The problem is they may understand too much. And then we have the issue of counter-transference. But the bigger issue is when we hear the veterans say, well, nobody will understand. The question becomes, what is it that you want them to understand? If you want them to understand what it's like to be in the jungles of Vietnam, 
or if you want them to understand what it's like uh, on, on a convoy in Iraq, they're not going to understand if they haven't been there. But I believe, and I, I say this to the clients, I think what they want people to understand is what they're feeling, what they're feeling, and once they describe their feelings, then, then we can be more empathic and we can understand. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be able to listen to them without horror. Yep. That's very important to be able to listen deeply and without horror. And don't get morbid and ask, it's did you have a helmet yeah. on? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I just I let them the, the, speak. Um, and I, I, I think it's important for them, like in the recovering so community, okay. when I first started working, I was first professional on the staff, and I got all sorts of, because I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't a recovering addict, and that's how it was. Um, I know I knew about addiction because my father was an alcoholic, uh, but as long I think as, I'm not a veteran, but as long as long as the, the military person has support in some group form where they can do this deep talking that they need to do, that they need to get these stories out, they can also work with someone who's not haven't been in the military, I think, as long as you're able to to listen deeply and without horror. Prejudice. That takes a lot. So, so real, again, real quick, I, I, use, I, I help the, the clients as best as I can when, I, when they're saying, well, my wife, my girlfriend, she, she doesn't understand. And I, I say to them, well, it's, if she tried to explain to you what it was like having a baby, <laughs> You wouldn't understand that either. But if she told you what what the pain was like, mm -hmm. then you would understand that possibly, mm -hmm. and they and they get. Uh -huh. Good, good. We're we're gonna wrap it up. Um, Want to thank the panel. You you did a fabulous job. Really appreciate your insights. And again, thank the audience. We've got a lot of great questions. We're going to. <laughs> Get back in touch with the panel, answer your questions, and we'll have you come back to the website to find your, the other answers. Um, but again, let's have a, pan, a hand for the panel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chuck Runyon, and I'm a member of the task force, and I'm in charge of the website. So um, the website that you use to sign up. Yeah. <laughs> um, the website that you use to sign up for the conference, which is HealingTheWoundedWarriorMI.com, will be morphing into a support website uh, for the Michigan Combat PTSD Task Force. Um, when you signed up for the conference, we got all of your email addresses. So I will be, uh, this week, working to turn it into an interactive site, um, a forum where you can sign in. We will have a list of all of the resources and contact information of all of the speakers. Um, last night, Dr. Shea mentioned an article that he was going to make available. We will have that available on the website. And um, I will send an email to you just once um, telling you when it's live with this new information. I say just once because of spam laws. But um, so we aim to make this a resource to further the co collaboration and um, all of the other questions, too, that you turned in that we didn't get, get a chance to address. We'll be on there, and we will have our panel of experts address them on the website. Thank you again. Well, we're about to close. Uh, Chuck does some marvelous things with computers. He just, you know, I, I'm computer illiterate. At 76, I still count with my toes, uh, so I don't know about all that, but he, he, he knows how to do all that stuff. Uh, I'd like to just thank the Howenstein Center uh, for all the things that they've done, and Tori, especially you. Yes. Come here. They, they say this is her first conference. I don't believe it. <laughs> she's one of the most organized people I've ever met, and she's just done a terrific job. And without her, this would not have nearly been as successful as it is. So sure. thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, we'd like to have this be the beginning of a dialogue, and uh, we'd like to offer our web page as a way to continue the discussion. Uh, I think that we really need to try to identify as many places as we can where veterans can get the kind of assistance that they need so that we can kind of map out for them where they need to go. Uh, some of them know better how to get to things than we do. I, I was on the board for uh, Heartside, and uh, th th those people on the street know how to run the street. They know how to go and can go get six or seven different places at the same time, and if the agencies didn't coordinate, they would be all over the place. So what we need to do is help the veterans who don't know their way around those systems to be able to find the kind of help and assistance that they really need. So go to our webpage, and if you've got some ideas and if you've got some suggestions of where they can get help, put it down, and we'll make sure that somehow it's coordinated with the veterans folks so that we have, we have one kind of way to get the information to everybody who needs their help. Uh, as I mentioned before, Elaine has been doing all the shooting over here, taking pictures and, and doing recordings, and he's done a marvelous job. And uh, we've worn him out because I've seen him sit back there and just look like he's really tired. But he's got the material will be available. The material will be available at heartsidecenter.com. And uh, Holland Center, what did I say? It's what happens when you get old. <laughs> My, it's about, not a problem with memory, but it's a problem with recall. <laughs> I really appreciate you all coming out. Uh, it, it's a dream come true for me and for the members of the task force. Uh, I have a love in my heart for the veterans who served our country. And I think they deserve the best that we as a community can give them. And one of the things that's first, I think, is that we pay attention to them. If we don't attend to it, then you're going to miss it. So I hope you'll pay attention to the veterans, because when I came back, in my uniform with a cross on it, I was spit on and called a baby killer. And we Vietnam vets don't want to see that happen to the young men and women who are serving our country today, no matter how popular or unpopular this war is. They're out there because our nation has sent them. And so they're really agents of the country. And when the country loses its vision about why it's sending to people to war, then the whole problem of moral agency gets terribly confused and it usually falls to the unit or the young soldier to accept responsibility that should really belong to the government or the people who send them. Mm -hmm. I really want to thank all my friends for participating in this. Uh, Jonathan Shea last night, uh, he, he, was, he was at his magnificent best. Uh, he really did an outstanding job last night, and he's just such a, he's such a wonderful man. And all the time that he's de dedicated to veterans, 20 years of his life listening to their stories and recording them and try to make those stories available to you and me in the form of a book. And it's probably the best interdisciplinary work that I have ever read. And uh, I thank Jonathan for coming. And Rita is off with my wife to the airport. And Steve, my friend Danakis, is over here. And uh, I can't thank you all enough for the support you've given them and the welcome that you've given them to Grand Rapids. I'd like to just take a moment before uh, the next panel is introduced to read a letter that I received from uh, Mayor George Hartwell. Dear Chaplain Kaiser, I'm sorry that I am not able to be present as planned for this important conference. 
Unfortunately, a long-standing commitment keeps me from joining you. I know how important it is for the veterans in Grand Rapids to have identified for them the resources in our community to assist in the transition to civilian life, especially after repeated combat deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. I am delighted that you are asking veteran organizations in this community to work with the medical and psychological treatment programs to ensure that we can get our veterans the service they deserve. The hidden and visible wounds of war demand that the entire city be involved in helping the veteran make the different transition, difficult transition to civilian life. I know individuals, families, churches, missions, and Veterans Administration and other helpers and caregivers are overwhelmed by the number of wounded in our community. I have taken a personal interest in solving the housing crisis for our veterans. We are working to rehouse our vet homeless veterans and to keep them in their homes when, when times are tough. I am concerned about the high number of suicides in the veterans community. Our veterans need to be embraced by a community of multidisciplined caregivers that is emphatic, non-judgmental, and positive. Please keep me posted on the outcomes of this conference, and I will do what I can to help and cheer the caregivers on. Sincerely, George K. Hartwell, Mayor of Grand Rapids. Very nice.